Um, can you tell me your name and, and uh, where you were, where you're from originally? Uh, Suka Delacroix, I'm from Bath in England. And tell me a little bit about where you grew up in Bath and in relation to other major cities and, and how that influenced your young adult life. Um, <clears throat> I was actually influenced by World War II. I was born in 1951. It was like six years after the war. And I grew up with um, my parents' generation were all wounded. I grew up with everybody had sideboards with photographs of men that died, young men. Dead. Not old men, but young men that were dead, and lots of amputees. <clears throat> the city I grew up in was bombed uh, only twice, but it was 800 people were killed, and I remember playing in the bomb sites. So I kind of grew up with that intense poverty um, and the shadow of World War II sort of hanging over everybody. And everybody kind of scrapping to get out of it and trying to make uh, a new England. Um, my parents were socialists and not terribly well educated, but um, <clears throat> my father was a labor man. Bath was also a very old city. It was actually built by the Romans. Um, and we had no religion. I had none of that, absolutely zero religion. <clears throat> they mentioned it at school sometimes. And I get home, I remember going home and asking my father what, uh, what God was, because it was mentioned in some sort of, and he said, uh, oh, don't believe that shit. Just let it go in one ear and add the other for the shit it is. And uh, he was right, actually. Of course, a lot of the people where I grew up were pagans because it's near Stonehenge. So the witches and <clears throat> weirdos from all over the world would go there to Stonehenge. And I did have, uh, at one point, our neighbors were Druids. And, um, <clears throat> and I remember my mother saying to me, now you can go out to play, but don't play with those Druid kids. Because they were quite rebellious. So I suppose it was, everybody has a different upbringing. But mine... When I came to America, I realized how different it was. You don't have Druids living next door here. <laughs> Not openly. And you weren't, no, and, and you weren't bombed. Yeah. Um, so your teenagers were the teenagers of America as well, meaning that, that 60s time frame. Um, what was the, you were in England still. Right, and <clears throat> right. I, well, my mother was a big rock and roll fan. She liked uh, Roy Orbison and Buddy Holly, and uh, so I kind of grew up with that. And I, although I'm an only child, I have, my mother has some gypsy blood, and there's a lot of family there. I think I've, maybe I've got a hundred cousins or something, and they just bred like rabbits. And uh, so I had lots, my peer group at the time, I suppose, were really not school people, because I was a sissy boy, so I was kind of rejected by school people. But all my cousins in that, you know, with their beehive hairdos and, you know, hoping one day they could marry Elvis. And I grew up with rock and roll, really. And in the 60s, <clears throat> I became, I really rebelled against my parents' politics by being more of an anarchist. That was more attractive to me because I didn't see the point of having any laws whatsoever. You know, I'm still a bit like, uh, so and when the hippie movement came along, it was just perfect for me because I could grow my hair long and uh, I could be a little bit more girly than perhaps I could have been if it hadn't come along. Um, <clears throat> I became very interested in Dada and, uh, and the arts in the 60s. It was, it was a very artsy time for me. Um, then I married. I met some, um, <clears throat> I had a boyfriend who was in the Royal Air Force, he was an officer. I had a job, I've never, I'm not the kind of, I wasn't the kind of hippie that dropped out. I believed in working and paying taxes and uh, trying to change the world at the weekends, really. <laughs> I actually worked for the civil service, I was in the Ministry of Defense, I signed the Official Secrets Act. Um, and <clears throat> what else was I talking about? Oh yes, I had a boyfriend, but I met this woman who was, she was like a, a 
bit of a biker. And she did hang out with some bikers, and she was astounding. I still don't know what it was. Oh, but it was definitely love. I was definitely bisexual then, for sure. I knew it. And she knew it. And we were married 12 years, and we had two children. And I have four grandchildren. Is everybody and that, that part of your family all still in England? Oh, I, I'm a great believer that one should never live in the same country as one's children. I really think you should have them and then get the fuck out, really. Do you have any interaction with them at all? Oh, yeah, they come and visit me. I meet them in Disney World sometimes, which I think is a good place to meet anybody. <laughs> <laughs> So after 12 years of marriage, um, where you were still in England, and, and, yeah. and what, was, what was your life as, as, as a bisexual or gay man at that point, and, and we're talking about maybe early 70s that now? Right, yeah, well I got married in 71, um, I, yeah I was married 71 to, I don't know, 81, 82 or something. Um, I was, I started writing for... A, an alternative paper called Spark Magazine. I mean, in Chicago you had the seeds, we had Spark. And um, I hadn't had any formal education. I was working at the age of 16. I never went to college. We, I was working class people in the 60s never went to college. I don't even know if they do that now. <clears throat> I mean, it simply wasn't... They found ways that stopped you doing it. They wouldn't... At the school I went to, nobody went to university, and the word university was never mentioned. They would not let poor kids go. So, because poor kids might change something, you know. <clears throat> That's what they're worried about. So, um, I never went to university. No, I was married, and I was involved in uh, Spark Magazine and um, the anti-apartheid group. I was quite passionate about <clears throat> various uh, Friends of the Earth, briefly. Uh, but always politically active, always. Uh, the campaign uh, for nuclear disarmament, um, mostly the anti-apartheid group. Though. I was picked up. I was never charged with anything, but I was picked up so many times. It's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What they, they did then, there were so many people demonstrating um, against what was happening in South Africa that 2,000 people would be arrested. They could not put them through the courts. They would drive out into the country and bust us and drop us off. We had to like find our way back. <laughs> so, so you, what, what was the timeline that brought you to America? Like, was that ever something you planned to do, or did <clears> something happen? No, I had no intention in coming here, and I had no interest in coming here, to be honest. I followed American politics through the underground press. Um, I'm talking about uh, Martin Luther King. I. I don't, I don't know if I was knowledgeable about I was as knowledgeable as anybody could be about what was happening in America, uh, the Vietnam War, which I demonstrated against in London. And um, <clears throat> I, knew, I knew about Stonewall at the time, I found out. Um, what was the question? What, what kind of, since America wasn't really on your oh. sights to move to, how did, you, <coughs> how did you even come here? Oh, about 1981, I met this young man. The marriage was not right. I don't know what was wrong. Maybe the gay side of me was coming out more. Um, I don't really think about things like that. But um, <clears throat> I had, I got, I met this young man, and I divorced my wife. He lived in a, he lived in a Dada anarchist commune uh, called the Crud Arts Workshop in in a basement in a, a Georgian building in Bath. And um, there were a lot of these communes around. So for <clears throat> eighteen months, I moved in with him, um, there was a sign up outside, it's not, it's not grammatically correct, but it said La Maison Imbecile, it's the house, we called it the House of Imbeciles, anything between 7 and 30 people lived in that place, musicians, artists, activists, the, uh, the phone was tapped, <coughs> sometimes you'd pick up the phone and heard the conversation that somebody's had before, we didn't have very good recording equipment then. So uh, and we organized demonstrations, and the Dada part of it, there were Dada events, really strange and odd. We put someone up for election who didn't exist, and um, a woman that kept poodles. And um, <coughs> I've got a lot of newspaper cuttings about all this 
So, but that I did that, and I met this young man, and he was. I started writing with him, and that's when I started writing for the gay press, um, Gay Times, and I had a column. We had a column in Capital Gay. We wrote together um, articles and everything, and um, I was with him for six years. But I think there was there was eleven years between us, and also <clears throat> I should I really shouldn't say this, but he was very middle class, and that old class thing in England, it never goes away. How liberated you think you are, <laughs> it's always there. So, I was, uh, so anyway, we split up, but I met, that's when I met Ian, the American, mm -hmm. in a bar, yeah. and he was working there for a, some corporate <clears throat> company, and we could have stayed there, or we could have come here, and I felt that my time in England was over. I, I felt I'd done everything that they would allow me to do as a working class person. And so he had an apartment in Chicago, and that's how I got here. He brought me here in 88 for a vacation to see if I liked it or not. He took me to Brooklyn, Disney World, and Chicago to see if I'd like America. <laughs> Well, it must have worked because I came over in ninety one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then you created a whole new life for yourself. And how did yeah. you like? How did you start on that path of, of both? Uh, you continue the gay journalism from England, but then translating that into also being enamored with, with gay history. I, I don't know if I was particularly interested in history before. <clears throat> See, in England, it's like here people study Shakespeare. In England, for me, Shakespeare is like a part of me. It's not something I study, it just it's a part of me. And in England, because of the great vast history, it's it's just a part of me. Growing up in a Roman town, my father would take up Roman coins in the garden, you know. And um, we'd have to take them to the museum. My father dug up when he was a plumber before the war, he dug up a stone coffin. I walked to school <coughs> on a path on a, Rome, on a road that was built by the Romans. And it's where they marched to conquer Wales. You know, It's called the Old Fast Way. And so I used to sit on a, a wall doing my homework that was built by the Romans. So, and there was a medieval city there as well. So it was just a part of me. I didn't realize it wasn't something I studied. It just was me. But when I got here, I knew nothing about the history, but I kept hearing things in bars that fascinated me. I mean, the Mafia, we don't have the Mafia in England. We have, in my hometown, there's a society called the Fuchsia Society for the Fuchsia Flower. And there's, I remember, there's the Chromosanthemum Society for people that like, and they hated each other. And that was the big thing, how these two groups fought. So we had that. We had flower societies, we did not have them all. So when I was hearing stories of the mob, and some of the old drag queens, you know, used to tell me <coughs> stories about the mob, that's when I went to Outlines, as it was then. And, well, I went to buy a book, and there wasn't a book. Nobody had written a book. So I thought, I just thought it would be a good column. Mm -hmm. And it was, too. So, but I didn't know, they were talking about bars, I didn't know what they were talking about. I remember someone said Sherry's, and I spelt it Sherry's, because I was fanatic. I knew nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. And then people started writing in, and saying, oh, you know, you got it all wrong, and, you know. And I thought, this is good, because it's like audience participation <laughs> here. And, um, I was surprised, I knew it would be popular, but I was surprised how popular it was. I could stop. Everywhere I get dragged and people would tell me about their own lives. And I realized that ordinary people have extraordinary lives. And that everybody has a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, amazing what, uh, what people went through. You know, people mm -hmm. older than me. You know, I interviewed somebody who was 96. Mm -hmm. I could find people talking about the 1930s. It, it, to me it was like breathtaking.
And then they started dying after I interviewed them. And I realized how important it was to get these stories down and how they could be lost because they were not recorded in newspapers. So you did the column for several years, and including then into Windy City Times and, right. and other, other newspapers. Um, but something sparked you to then change course and, and do a more thorough fact-based history too. So what was what was the turning point for you on that? <coughs> well, <laughs> it was uh, a couple of unmentionable people in the community who thought I shouldn't do it. And uh, I thought, I've never been good at being told what to do. But I waited for somebody else to do it. I wanted somebody else to do it. Because I was, there were parts of it that I, I was just lost in it. You know, I, I just didn't know what they were talking about, you know. And sometimes, like, the 50s. And <clears throat> but then I thought, well, nobody's going to do it. So in the end, I decided I had to do it. Well, one of the reasons nobody did it is because some of the people that could have done it died. Right. Like Greg Sprague and, and, and some other people who had right. got, taken down those histories <coughs> that were valuable later. Right. Well, people kept saying, why don't you publish the, uh, the column? in a book and I didn't want to do that um, now I think it would be quite a good thing to do but at the time I didn't want to do that because they were there already you could look mm -hmm. I wanted to do something I wanted to give something to I heard that young people were doing like LGBT courses at school to me this is like I still find it astounding I can't believe you know I come from a time when you couldn't be a gay teacher, you know, this is astounding. And I thought, well, something should be, they should have something, I want to give them a starting point, something that's absolutely factual. <clears throat> so I started to, and it had to be before Stone, I had to cut it off somewhere. I mean, you know, Stone was such a marvelous thing, you just cut it off. Right, 28th of June, it's over, book, end, of, end of the book. So, um, but also I wanted to, I read all the, <clears throat> the stuff that Marie Kudo had done and that Gregory Sprague had done and I wanted to, I said I can't do it and I've got to add. I'm not rewriting what everybody, I'll just be bored. And so I wanted to add to it. But when I started it, I was completely hooked on detail. And... Um, I hunted it down. I didn't, I'm not a historian. <clears throat> they call me one in the press, but I'm not. I'm just a reporter. But I hunted stories down like I became absolutely fascinated by Pearl Hart's girlfriend because nothing was known, just her name. And the vague thing that she was an actor at some point. Um, so once I started hunting it, um, I found out this incredible story, how she, when she was a child, she was, had a car accident. I have a, also had a, a photograph of her somewhere as a child, which was in the newspaper. <clears throat> I think people hadn't, I got the impression that historians have been, it was like the Henry Gerber thing, I found the account in the newspaper. I think people didn't look hard enough. I think they were, I don't know why. So, yeah, I wanted to do something fact-based. And when it came time to publish it, a couple of people suggested the University of Wisconsin Press. And I'm like, I, I, I was working at the age of 16. I've never been to a university. You know, I don't know anything about that. I honestly sent it there to shut these people up. Because then it would come back, and then I would go for the small local press that I wanted. But... They took it, but they checked everything. So tell us the name of the book and, and a little bit about where it starts. Because you talk about where it finished, but t tell us the name. In, in the book. <clears throat> right, Chicago Whispers. And I can never remember the subtitle, even now. <clears throat> uh, a History of LGBT Chicago Before Stonewall. That's it. And it's the book starts in the first accounts of um, homosexuality in the Chicago area in 1673 with uh, Marquette, the French explorer, wrote about feminine men in the 
Indian tribes. Um, <clears throat> that was fascinating. That, but that's mostly written in other places. I did find a transgendered uh, Native American who was at the World's Fair, an artist, which was absolutely fascinating story. And it goes from that until the night of Stonewall. Um, I know that was in New York, but it, I talk about what was happening in, in Chicago that night <coughs> um, in the gay bars, because there were some accounts of them. Um, a lot of the book is set around the 20s um, with a tower town, uh, the gay-ish neighborhood then, and a lot of writers, and, um, but I also wrote about the 30s, the war, the Second World War in Chicago, and the 50s, which was McCarthy. You can almost, each of the decades has an identity, really, mm -hmm. and, and, and the 60s, which were an interesting time. A lot of your writing centers around the bars, uh, because pre-Stonewall especially, the bars were really the most identifiable gay places. Right. They were our community centers and our sports leagues and all that other kind of stuff was right. centered on the bars. Um, talk about your, your as this someone coming from the outside, what you witnessed about the bars that was so interesting to you. What I saw in the bars when I came here. <clears throat> well, when I came in 88, I went to Sidetrack, which was tiny at the time, and I saw, I remember seeing uh, cowboys dancing together, and I'd never seen that. I just thought that it was quite bizarre, watching cowboys dancing, or even men dancing and touching each other, because I wasn't involved much in the gay scene in England. I, I'm not, strangely enough, I'm not, I've never been the bar type. Um, <coughs> I ended up photographing a lot of people with bars. Um, the history of the bars, I realized that, you know, Back in the 60s and before that, they were the community centers. And um, all the way back to uh, the first bar I could find in Chicago was 1928, Diamond Lills on Rush Street. And they were the places where, the only places that men could meet, really, although they could meet on the street, you know, Michigan Avenue was quite popular for cruising, or in parks. Um, I think lesbians were more bar oriented back then. There was a lot of lesbian bars, but getting lesbians to talk is very difficult, you know. Especially, well, one thing I did notice was that this city is black and white, <laughs> and even more so back then, and that there were two gay communities. There was a black one and there was a white one, mm -hmm. and they did not cross except white people went to the jazz clubs on the south side. Black people never went to the white bars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you mentioned Diamond and Lils. What, I know there's some other ones that you've talked about, both in, in video interviews and in your book, um, uh, like the, the First Ward Balls and Jack or Stone. Talk about some of the other people you learned about in writing about the city. <clears throat> well, the ones I found the most interesting, and somebody should either do a documentary or write a book about this, are the male impersonators on the vaudeville stage. I was stunned there were so many from England, for one thing, that came here. Um, this was an amazing, t always has been for theatre, you know, but back in the late 19th century, um, I would love to have gone, I would love to go back and see those women. I mean, they did, some of them lived as men. One of them married, I found a, a lesbian marriage, it's in the book. Um, she married a woman, and she married a man, and I think she married a woman again. <coughs> but she always waited until they died. <laughs> um, no, uh, no, no, I'm lost now. So, the, so talk about the first word ball and bathhouse gem. Yeah, that was, that was a political scam, you know, that was a wonderful scam, because uh, bathhouse John and Hinky Dink Kenna had were politicians and they raised money and part of their district was the levy, which was the prostitute neighborhood. And they had a ball once a year and uh, all the prostitutes had to be there. Anybody who didn't want to be arrested and raided was there at the ball. 
they were female personages at the ball. Um, they called it an orgy. I, I don't know, it wasn't, an, it wasn't an orgy that we think of an orgy, but I wonder what, to what extent it was. It was outrageous, but I don't, the accounts are that this was outrageous, this event, but I don't know the extent of what they meant by outrageous. I would love to know, though, because it couldn't be, it's not an orgy. But it was something, a drunken binge or something. It's probably like um, Jackhammer on a Saturday night. <laughs> there were some other characters that came out of that era, and Sam Stewart was one of them. Um, he, he wasn't only in Chicago during his lifetime, but it right. certainly was a big influence here. Right, I did, I did write about... Um, <clears throat> well, the original title of the book was... Uh, it was too long, but it was... Uh, people who lived in, loved and visited Chicago. So a lot of the people didn't live here for long, a lot of them were just performers coming through, Bar Rainey. But I do think they influenced, everyone I wrote about I think influenced this city or was influenced by the city. You know, Bar Rainey recorded songs here, even though she, I don't think she lived here. And, um, um, no, I'm lost again. Sam Stewart. So, oh, Sam Stewart, yeah. <coughs> Well, he was, uh, well, the, the, um, well, he had several careers, didn't he? He was a tattoo artist and a writer, and, um, um, but I've never, I've never found anybody that would actually knew him, or even Chuck Runslow wouldn't talk about it. Hmm. I don't know why. Hmm. So, but, that, you know, somebody wrote a great book about that. A great <laughs> book about Sam Stewart and a great book about Chuck Runslow, yeah. so... <laughs> Um, let's I told you what they did to me. <laughs> um, Henry Gerber is this fascinating person that not even a lot of Chicagoans know about, but you were able to uncover some some of the, of the original yeah. reportings about that. Talk about Henry Gerber in your mind, what his role was in Chicago's gay movement. I, well, it's, it's only uh, only since people became aware of it has he become important. <clears throat> he died in seventy one. Um, he was a German immigrant came to Chicago and uh, he was actually in the army. Um, he started a gay group in 1925, I think, and it lasted six months. He produced two copies of uh, a publication, none of which have been found, um, although I proved it existed. Um, and that would have been the end of it. If it hadn't been for, in the late 50s, he started writing to, I think, one magazine and talking about this group he started in 1924, and I don't think many people, hardly anybody knew about it, and I don't think anybody in Chicago knew about it. <clears throat> when I, I read everybody else's biography of him, and, I, and they're all, they're, they're, they've all rewritten each other's biography mm -hmm. of him. It's all the same thing. <clears throat> and. Uh, I didn't want to do that, and that was the most difficult chapter for me because I thought, I'm not doing that, I'm not going to rewrite everybody else, what everybody else, I've got to find something new. And I found several things that were new actually. And then I realized, if he came out in the late 50s and said I started a gay group in 1924, did he? How do we know he wasn't lying? Everybody says he did. But where's the piece of, you know, where's the evidence? Because he said that he was arrested and it was written up in this newspaper and nobody's ever found it. And I said, what? There's no proof that this man ever started any group at all. I couldn't see. So I said, I have to prove that this is a factual book. I have to prove that he started this group. So I set about finding that uh, newspaper article, which nobody's read for 40 years, but I thought, well, I've got, to, I've, got to, I've got to really search for this. And I, <clears throat> it took me a while, and I realized it wasn't the newspaper he said it was in, for one thing. And even Jonathan Ned Katz couldn't find this. Uh, uh, Gregory Sprague never found it either. Um, And yeah, the newspaper he said it was in didn't actually exist then. And yet they quote it over and over again in the biographies. That's how I found out they're copying each other. So it's gone under by that point. <clears throat> so I phoned up a man called Franklin, I think was his Franklin Rosemont. He's, he's an author of several, he's, he's dead now. 
he's buried next to, um, he's buried with the anarchists at Bodine Cemetery. He wrote books about anarchism and history books about the Dill Pickle Club. And I phoned him up and I s explained my problem. I said, what was the, I said, 1925 sex crime. What was the scuzziest newspaper? You know, this cheap tabloid nasty newspaper. And he said, Chicago American. When I went and I found it, <coughs> there it was. And I said, how could anybody have missed it? But it was funny because I was in the Harold Washington Library and when I found it, I screamed. And the security came. <laughs> and I had to explain that I just got a little bit overexcited. Because I'm looking at something they've been looking for for 30 years or whatever. And, uh, and uh, joy of joy, is the, they, he was turned in by his 12-year-old daughter into the police, which I thought was a wonderful story, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's how I found out about him. And then I found out that in 1925, a Paris newspaper published extracts from Friendship and Freedom. And even though they didn't, we never found one. So I set about finding <coughs> these, what they said. And I, I found it and I had it translated. It's very boring. But it is the original <coughs> text, you know. So we do have a little bit now. And then I found out that um, after World War One, well, he was interned during World War One. After that, he joined the military. All the biographies say that he joined the American Army and he went to Germany. Well, I'm thinking, what did he do? <coughs> what did he do over there? And I found out, and I don't know where, that he worked for a newspaper, A M A R O C, Amarok or something, which stands for something, and. Um, I found this really obscure book written about the newspaper. And so I got the book, you know, and um, from Amazon. And I was reading it, and it's got the day-to-day -day life of the people that work for the newspaper. So I thought, well, this is nice background. This is kind of what he did. He, he was a, apparently he was a typesetter. This is what he would have seen every day. So I'm making notes and making notes. Then I get to a page, and it says... Uh, when the newspaper closed and the Americans came back out of Germany after World War I, um, there was one man left to wrap up the newspaper, and it was Henry Gerber. I was... What? I was it was amazing. So, um, so that's how that whole <coughs> chapter came about, and I do... Um, I was contacted by Jonathan Metcats, who I didn't know, and... Um, he said, when I read your Henry Gerber chapter, I cried. So, I made an old man cry, which is <laughs> quite good. But I did that kind of research on all of it, you know. People don't notice the, or maybe they do, I don't know. That was the kind of, in, it was just, I was just almost rapid with getting to the bottom of everything, you know, Pearl Hart's girlfriend and, I, I was got so excited when I found Pearl Hart's passport in the Chicago History Museum and seen that she'd gone to England. And I tied it in with uh, newspaper accounts of uh, Blossom being there. So she maybe went to, you know, and Pearl Hart, I think, had a, I don't know if I put it in the book, but she had a blueberry farm or something in Michigan with her two strange girlfriends. What were some of your other favorites? I know you've mentioned Jacques Christian before. Again, if you could say the name of the person we're talking about. Jacques Christian? <clears throat> um, yeah, I found... I don't know where I found out about him. So I, Because I would interview somebody in some crummy bar somewhere, and they'd say, oh, you've got to talk to... <clears throat> which would set me off on some other, uh, you know, thing. And Jacques Christian, I know, lived on 79th and Drexel. And I was going to go and interview him, and... The big thing about that was I had African-American friends who said, don't, don't even think about going. And I said, well, you know, I, he's not going to come up here. He's like in his 70s. So I do know I got on the bus. And they said, you won't see any white people down there. And I said, oh. I got on the bus. I didn't see. I never saw a white face at all. <laughs> and I went down on the bus to 79th and Drexel and I got off. And I remember there was this group of teenagers there. 
And when you see, you know, you see black kids on TV and they're always in gangs and they're killing people, you know. And <clears throat> I had like an expensive camera and I thought, oh, what am I going to do? I'm just going to walk through. Ian always says, pretend you've got your best red polka dot dress and just walk through like you're as good as any of them. <laughs> so I did that because it was just kids hanging out, really. But I got there and I, it was, he had a costume store. <clears throat> he made all those... Uh, totally gay priest things for the black preachers, you know. And um, I knocked on the door and Jacques came to the door and he was living. His bed was in the store and there was, he must have been like 21 years old. <laughs> he was with somebody and I thought, good for you, you know. But he, what interested me about him is that he started a ball that split off from the Finney's balls. And the Finney's balls go back and to everybody said 1933, but nobody knows what the beginning of it was. And if they do, they're lying. Um, I found an event in 1933 down on the south side that I believe is the beginning of the Finney's Balls, and it was a gay wedding. And um, <clears throat> But the Finney's Balls went up in, into the 70s, and Jacques Christian started his own ball because all the white drag queens were winning, and he thought it was by, he got taken over by, possibly, that's what he said, by more white people. So he started the ball, but I, when I was interviewing him, I was very conscious that there, he was, there was a direct line from him going back to 1933, mm -hmm. and that unbreakable line, which was just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and he died, I suppose, a couple of years afterwards, didn't they? They, right. they, all, they all died. Tony Midnight died, and lots of the people I interviewed. The 96, well, I don't know if he was 96. I say he's 96. I don't know how old this man was. <clears throat> I interviewed this guy, and he told me he, um, he must have been very young, but he said he crept into a drag bar during Prohibition, a speakeasy. And I sat out of, was it that drug? I so said, it was such a good story, I had to get, find out if it was true, like Sherlock Holmes, you know. And, um, but nobody, there was no accounts of the speakeasies. I mean, they were just not really there, were they? Right. <clears throat> but I thought, these clubs, I'm sure some of them must have gone to jail after when Prohibition ended. And it was called the K-9 Club. And sure enough, I went through some scuzzy newspaper, and there was an ad, 1933, I think, Prohibition ended, and the K-9 Club tried to go legit. There's uh, an ad in my book, actually. Um, it's quite obviously a female impersonation bar. And Mayor Kelly obviously closed it down. It didn't last very long. But it was long enough for me to prove it was there. Mm -hmm. I took leads from the interviews I did with people. I took their leads and set about finding the truth behind what they were saying. I know I interviewed uh, <clears throat> an older man at the beginning and he said he was worked at the wind-up bar on State Street in 1949 and it was raided and closed down and he told me about his life. And so that's what would happen. I, would, I went back to find out um, from the newspapers whether it was raided and it was. Mm -hmm. And he told me what happened inside and funny enough standing outside of the bar that night was Chuck Renslow. And he told me what was happening on the outside, you know. <clears throat> and, you know, this guy told me what was happening on the inside. And, uh, and then finding out why that raid happened, because the raid always happened when someone was being elected or, you know, there was a, an election going on. There was always a reason for it. And um, so then I had to find out the general um, thing that was happening around there at that time. And uh, who the captain was, and uh, I think it was Captain Harrison who raided all those bars, and why it was happening. And it, I learned, I learned about America writing that book because I knew nothing, hmm. nothing at all. I mean, I knew who McCarthy was. <clears throat> I didn't realize he someone had outed him in a newspaper. You know, I didn't know that had happened until I actually, it was like, 
I am thinking on my feet. Um, I just became fascinated with their lives. Mm -hmm. the, 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 there was an area on North Avenue that was w women lesbian bars, you know, and uh, and the dreadful people that ran these bars, you know, the the murders and I talked to a drag queen and the first night as bartender of the Shoreline Seven in the early sixties. She was told where the loaded guns were taped under the bar, and if there's any trouble, just shoot them, lock the door, and we'll deal with it. <laughs> I think I heard you say at one point you have over 800. You know, I do have a list. So t tell me, say, say that. <clears throat> oh, I have a list of, um, yeah, I list things. I have a list of over 800 gay bars going back to Diamond Mills is the first one. I can actually name. I know there were gay bars before that. Um, there were some chapters in the book that I had to take out that had never been published. Why, why so? Too big. They couldn't afford to. My, that book was twice as big. Mm. I edited that book in half. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> I have a chapter on... Uh, I have, there's a small chapter on Oscar Wilde's visit to Chicago. There's a chapter on murders. Um, there's a chapter on homosexuality in the hobo community in Chicago, which is fascinating. Um, homosexuality was accepted among the hobo community. My theory is that a lot of people left town and rode the rails because they were mm. gay. I don't know that. I mean, I didn't go into it that much. <coughs> but, um, Talk a little bit on the bar scene um, about the Mafia and what you learned about that. Well, they really can, well, the Mafia controlled vice from Prohibition onwards. And uh, so they, they ran all the liquor, obviously, during Prohibition. And after that, anything that was vice, it was theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the ridiculous of making laws about, you know, being moralistic with laws. <clears throat> they owned or were taking kickbacks. The first time I came up against them was the guy I interviewed for the wind-up bar. And he was on State Street. And when it was raided in 1949, when I looked at the newspaper accounts, it said in the newspaper accounts that it belonged to the Gusick Allegretti uh, Capone uh, syndicate. So I thought, well, that's great, because that's proof, you know, <clears throat> the first proof I could get. And I started to investigate Jake Gusick, who was Al Capone's bookkeeper and um, the Allegretti family and so I would include that in my questions that I asked people after that and um, they ran all the drag bars around Diversity and Clark Street they ran all the in the late 60s from the mid 40s to the mid 60s the gay area was around Division Clark and Division and they ran all those bars and I started getting people to tell me about the characters that were in these bars. Um, wonderful characters, and which, when they remember them, it's always with like, this great fondness. There was Fran Wilson, who, who was a, a rather sort of tarty woman, and she used to sell, uh, she was a 26 dice girl, which was a kind of gambling game. And she sold uh, Benzedrex from her bra. And uh, <coughs> Opal, <coughs> Opal was the midget as they called them then, and uh, she worked for the mob. She was hired by the mob to go into bars and check they weren't uh, taking stealing money, and uh, she was like, uh, and there was, and they just talked about these wonderful, Ralph Marco at Shoreline 7, all straight people, but they ran the bars. Ralph Marco at uh, Shoreline 7 and his um, huge, great, um, great dame, which he called Smiley, and he had some kind of aquarium in the bar, and it just, and I would say, you know, where was the bathroom? Did what was on the jukebox? And I became obsessed with the, the culture of the bars back then and how people had to go in and some of the bars you had to keep your hands on top of the bar. Um, <clears throat> if you went down and scratched your leg, you were out, you know. I interviewed March Summit. She used to go to the volleyball lesbian bar, which was Bob. <clears throat> and she said... 
uh, that when the police came in the front, they'd go, because it was, they were all butch and femme, and they had to run into the bathroom, and Marge said she had to get her girlfriend's shoes on, because they had to have three items of female apparel, so they all be in the bathroom, keeping the police out, swapping over their clothes. I said, what a life, you know? Um, but exciting, you know? And I think I kind of got excited by listening to them talking about it. Nobody had ever asked these people about their lives before. They were just ordinary people. Until you talk to them, and you think, oh my God, these were not ordinary lives that they led. Because I didn't really talk much to the big sort of gay activists <coughs> in the community. I talked to the people in the bars that I could find, you know, the, just, and also they spill the beans, you get the truth from some drunk in a bar, you know, he's been there a long time, and, um, <clears throat> no, the culture of the gay bars, and I love the, there was a place called the, the Blue Park on Irving Park, and they all got around the piano, and if you stood outside, someone said it was like a chorus, it was like a gay chorus because these people would sing around the piano week after week after week with uh, Georgia, the, the black piano player who never wore any underwear and proved it sometimes. And, <laughs> and I, it's just like I was surprised that they survived with that kind of adversity, that kind of, because they could lose their jobs, you know, if they raided. And still they got together and still they sort of found each other and still fell in love, even though they couldn't get an apartment together. It's, they survived. Um, and they're still there and nobody had ever gone out and talked to them about it. Mm. So I spent <coughs> years actually just talking to these people about their lives and finding out things. I interviewed a couple of African-American women anonymously, it was all arranged, I could phone them up over the phone, but I wasn't supposed to know who they were, and uh, to get the story of what was happening down on the South Side, you know, mm. which is, they, as far as I know, had never been written about much, what was happening down there in the 40s, you know. Um, I spoke to an old, I don't know who he was, it was an African-American playwright, and that's all I knew. It was an anonymous interview, uh, talking about <clears throat> what was happening down there. I mean, just amazing lives. The, the Reverend Cobb, as well, had a gay... It, he was a crook, really, but he did support gay people all the way back to the 30s. They came to his church. White people that needed God would go to his church on the black church on the south side and be welcomed now from the 30s on I and mean, it's just remarkable this was never a lie and I'm thinking this was never in newspapers or this is all completely unwritten mm -hmm. history and um how do you think working on all of this really influenced you in, in your own you know as a gay man and someone not from this country how, how did they influence you their stories well, I felt incredibly uh, privileged to be able to see this. It was like seeing a, a wonderful movies that nobody else could see. You know, reading wonderful books that nobody else had read. And I did feel a responsibility to treasure these these memories of these people and respect all of them and what they've gone through. And they're almost like sacred to me. You know, I still bump into a lot of these people <clears throat> and they still thank me for telling their stories, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, I wish there was... How did it change me? Um, I don't know, but it, it did. Well, it made me think that I was a part of something, the gay part of me, the bit that's gay in the gay community. It gave me a whole history that I didn't know existed. I knew it was there, I obviously, I knew there was, but then it, they actually,
actually, it was like opening a window. I could see all this stuff that had happened and just how remarkable these people were and how many books there were. Somebody's got to do that burlesque book. It's not going to be me. But somebody has to do that. I mean, there was uh, women dressing up as men and dancing around as sailors on stage. It's just too good. <laughs> you know, I did meet... Uh, <coughs> I did meet a vaudeville star. I was in Big Chicks um, performing in the Feast of Fools, and I, there was, if I see an old guy in a bar, I'm there. I, I'm right on. And I talked to him. I think his name was Sam. He said I could go to his house and interview him. We could remember the 30s, so I went to Evanston, and he actually did. He was a vaudeville performer, and he did his vaudeville act in front of me. And I, I thought, God, this is so. Like, Unbelievable. I can see this. You know. So, no, I, I, I treasure every moment and every story that I was told. And there's a lot more out there. The column could have gone on, yeah. you know, really. Because it could never get old. Everybody was reading it, mm -hmm. you know, and joining in with the column. And, mm -hmm. But I had to stop to write the book. I couldn't do oral history and history. What are the other, so you said there's there's a couple other projects you've been working on, so one that's on hold, and tell us a little bit about both of them. Um, <clears throat> well, one I wrote and decided not to write, <laughs> but I did write it, and that was, uh, it was an extension, it was sort of part two of Chicago Whispers, really. It took the story of gay life in Chicago from the day after Stonewall to the first issue of Gay Life uh, newspaper. Um, I've written the book, I don't like it, that's basically what it is. I need, to, I need time to maybe go back and, and look at it again, but that time is not right at this moment. Um, this, the book I have written and sent to the publisher, is, um, it's about how the militant gay liberation front came out of the uh, hippie underground anti-Vietnam War movement of the 1960s. But the stories, it's not me looking back at it, the stories I quote a lot from newspapers um, because, as I did with Chicago Whispers, because I like the people I'm writing about to tell their own stories as much as they possibly can. I don't think, I'm not presumptuous enough to go back and analyse what it meant. You know, I'm not interested in that. I want to hear their voices. Um, <clears throat> Chicago Whispers was about the whispers that were kept as whispers and newspaper accounts, what they said about it. And the book about the underground press is about how the underground press um, adopted um, homosexual rights as uh, a part of that whole revolutionary movement of the 60s. We want the world and we want it now. You know, Jim Morrison. Uh, it's about that <clears throat> and the militant gay liberation front that came out of it and, and what happened to the gay liberation front. It really ate itself, you know, really. It, it fed upon itself until there was nothing left. Uh, but it's that. Also, it covers not just the big cities, but a lot of the small places. Uh, not that Atlanta's small. But uh, it, it, the, I've written about the Gay Liberation Front in Florida, uh, which is a pretty dangerous place to be out and gay at the time. <clears throat> and uh, New Orleans and uh, Philadelphia, Seattle. Uh, cities that are not usually written about. But, so that's the, the book that is with the publisher at the moment. So now tell us a little bit about your next phase. You've been almost a third of your life in Chicago. Right. And uh, how that has kind of shaped you and what your next, what you hope next. Well, <clears throat> Chicago is a place where I don't want to be old. That's why I'm moving to Palm Springs. I, I need the sun. But also I need to, I very much doubt I'm going to write another history book. And that's something ignite. At the moment, there's nothing else about gay history that sparks me enough to write a book, or I feel confident in writing a good book about. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to actually, I've had a long and
strange life and I'd never looked back at it and thought about writing it. I never, it never even crossed my mind. I'm not a nostalgic person. But writing about the 60s, I've had to confront my own 60s. And I'm looking at some of the more ridiculous and stupid ideas that the Gay Liberation Front had, and I'm thinking, well, I actually agreed with them back then, and sometimes I still agree with it now, you know. And um, so I thought, no, I think it's time I want to go back and... I, I mean, I spent 18 months in a Dada commune. It's a novel, really. So I'm thinking going back and just going over my life. I have written a memoir of um, my life as a sissy boy growing up after World War II in the bomb site, uh, which is with the University of Wisconsin Press. It's been there 18 months. Um, I don't know. They're obviously thinking about it. Just because Chicago Whispers was a success, it doesn't mean they're going to publish anything else by me, you know. Mm -hmm. That was pretty daunting because Chicago Whispers has been quite successful, and I've had to, the second one had to be as good as that. <laughs> that was pretty daunting. But no, I, I, it's time for me to leave, and, um, but I'm always, there's always going to be a part of me here. Mm -hmm. And I still want to work for the press here, and I'm taking all my archives which is thousands of newspapers, because the box is over there. And I'm still going to be, there's still going to be things I find there that are going to inspire me to write articles and a play or, or whatever. Otherwise, I would have got rid of them. There's a reason I'm taking them, and that must be it. I haven't quite finished yet. I'm real curious, based on your a little bit of your anarchist uh, background and sympathies, what you think of the LGBTQ movement now, now that you have this long perspective of where it's come from? Um, <clears throat> well, Obama changed everything. I mean, I don't agree with him on many, many things, but you can't argue with the fact that the man has changed everything. I think it changed with Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Once gays were serving openly in the, in the military, I think... It's very hard to criticize the people that are defending your freedom. They still do, but it's kind of hard to do that. I discovered that actually <coughs> in last year I was invited to speak in Danville, Illinois at a, a VA hospital. And I thought it was a joke, you know, but no. They arranged to meet me, and the local they all came up from Danville. This delegation met me in Starbucks here, and uh, <coughs> they were celebrating Gay Pride for the first time. They were very proud of it. Um, would I speak because of the book? And I, yeah, are you kidding? I'm there. So I went down, and there, there were these huge posters of the event up everywhere in this town that. I didn't see any traffic lights in this town. And it was a little Illinois town that I wouldn't want to be in on my, on my own. But these posters were everywhere with my face on and, you know, LGBT and military hospital. And I said to somebody, I said, how do you get away with that in this town? And they said, well, it's got a, it's got a very magical word on there that they can't argue with. I said, what? They said, veterans. And that's how they got away with it. Because nobody's going to say anything. You know, they might think it. They may have homophobic thoughts. Um, and I did the tour. I thought it was going to be... I thought it was the hospital gay group. And I actually wore a punk rock t-shirt. I thought it was, as we say in England, four dykes and a dog. You know, a tiny group of gays. Because only lesbians turn up for most things, you know. So, but no, there must have been... 150, 200 people there. I stood in front of this huge American flag. And um, all kinds of people there. You know, mm -hmm. They came from miles around. And uh, that's changed <coughs> in the last... Since Obama, I mean, I can't let I pick up the news and like, I see some state now. It's, the ban has been struck down. It's like remarkable. I never thought I'd see this. 
March Summit's wedding. I mean, was she 80 something? And she's getting married to a girlfriend, and I went to the wedding. I mean, I don't know how this happened. America seems to be slow, 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 then bam! Suddenly there's these bursts of. It's like everybody comes to their senses all of a sudden after being stupid for years, you know? I don't know about my anarchist beliefs now. I mean, that's where I started off when I was young. That doesn't mean I think it work in any way or shape or form. But I always go back to that. That's like my beginning place before I start being sensible about things, you know. Mm -hmm. And I always think with, I still don't have time for politicians. You know, I don't trust them. I think people that go into politics, going into politics is what you do when McDonald's have stopped hiring for me. You know, I think it's a pathetic thing to do. But, uh, but I'm quite happy now to sit back and working for the paper I never actually demonstrated or anything. My 80s, I was in battles, my leg is damaged from that, demonstrating against Margaret Thatcher on an anti-apartheid march when the police got me and damaged my leg. And, uh, but now I'm happy to sit back and let young people do it and I can just watch, you know. So, no, I think it's remarkable what's happening, and God, it took a long time. You know, we're not really there yet, but... Mm -hmm. I liked, actually, what Conchita Wirth said, the, the drag queen that won the Eurovision. They asked her about gay rights in Russia, what was happening in Russia, and she, she said, we're never going to give up. You know, we're not going to give up. That's what I want to hear from we're never going to give up. Excellent. Any final words to your Chicago uh, connections and, and leaving town? Well, if you're ever in Palm Springs, contact me. We could go for coffee in Starbucks or something. And, or lunch. And you're buying. <laughs>